Hello and welcome to Real Magic Review. My name is Steve Faulkner and I'm here again to help us stop spending all our money on a load of old tat and spend it on stuff that will actually make us better magicians rather than collectors of things. This week we have The Card Magic of Edward G. Brown by Trevor H. Hall. This is a re-release with annotations by Andy Gladwin. And before we get on with the review, please can you like and subscribe, hit the little bell so you get notifications and do go and check out cardmagiccourse.com. This is my online card magic course. It's a video course with in-depth tutorials of all the card moves you'll ever need and theory. We've just finished a, uh, a theory course on how to practice, which is all the latest research on trying to maximize your practice time. So that's cardmagiccourse.com. You can also get a free cull download, spread cull download, which is such a powerful move. That's an in-depth video download, which is cardmagiccourse.com forward slash cull. So let's get on with the review. So you may be thinking, who is Edward G. Brown? As I was about three weeks ago until I saw Andy Gladwin's short lecture uh, at the uh, the session convention. So basically he was almost seemed to be like the Di Vernon of the UK. He was a very well respected, highly skilled card magician. But unlike Di Vernon, he didn't release many material. There are only a few things published in magazines. Uh, he was very introverted and shy individual. And he only really performed for magicians. He was uh, very proud to be a hobbyist and he performed mostly at the Magic Circle where tragically he died at the age of 52, I think, in 1947, hours after coming off stage at a charity performance at the Magic Circle. Um, and this was tragic not only because obviously he died uh, at such a young age, but also because he was waiting to release his material. He always spoke about releasing a detailed and in-depth, uh, quite exclusive book when he finally had time to do it because he was overworked. He was a banker with the treasurer Magic Circle. Uh, he had a lot on his plate and it was that tragic thing of waiting uh, a little bit too late and he never reached his retirement uh, to publish this material until uh, it was published in 1973 by Trevor Hall. Now, the publication of this Magic Circle book seemed to do little to resurrect the legacy of Brown, basically because it was a very limited run and the, the details were a little bit lacking, but we'll go into that in a minute, and that's kind of what motivated this release. So now Andy Gladwin has re-released the original book with a study guide to help clarify and sort out some of the flaws in the original publication. And this, I'm not going to lie to you, I wasn't that excited about reading this book. I think... It's that weird prejudice some of us got that even though we know it's all nonsense, we kind of think we're really into the new stuff. We want to go for the new and shiny stuff. And this is a, you know, a guy that died in 1947. Uh, and then it was a book published 26 years later, which we have been told is a flawed book. So I wasn't that excited about it, but I wanted to review it because it seemed important and it's important to Andy. And I kind of trust this stuff. Uh, but again, it wasn't something I thought was going to be a page turner, but I was surprised. So we've got the original book by Trevor Hall, and as well as having 19 effects, this has a fair bit of introductory material, which gives us a really good idea of who Edward Brown was, his approach to magic and his dedication, uh, of course, to the magic circle. And then after the effects, there are six lectures transcribed. These go from 1934 up till 1947. Uh, as well as that, of course, we have Andy's study guide, which is 30 pages long. Uh, this has really got, got a really nice introductory bit as well, sort of going into who Edward Brown was a little bit more depth, also Trevor Hall, and also talks about the flaws of the original book and sort of why Andy's brought this uh, back to print. Uh, we also have a choice of most of the effects in it, not all of them, the ones that needed a bit of clarification, and part of that clarification is the referencing and crediting of the tricks, which, like I said, was a bit limited uh, from Trevor Hall. I started reading it and quite quickly I was drawn in. And I think I was drawn in because of the way it's written. Yes, it is a flawed book, the original I'm talking about, but it is not a badly written book. It's not a book that, that kind of you read and get frustrated at the writing style or anything like that. I actually think it's quite nicely written. And part of that, I think, is Trevor Hall's affection for Edward Brown. And it was quite moving. And I think that he only met him a handful of times because it was a lot harder to get around back then. And obviously we had no internet but he, he, he clearly had an affection for the man and his magic and his approach to magic and that shines through in the writing so that kind of drew me into that world uh, in a way so so straight away it's not a dry read it's not you know if you look at, at books like Roy Walton's books which is some of my favorite card magic books they're not really books that I can sit and read without cards in hand and enjoy the style of and that isn't that isn't um, criticizing them I think they're brilliant but this is something that with this introductory introductory material I was like I said I felt like I was having a good read rather than just reading a magic trick book 
Though there are some issues with the descriptions, which we'll go into later, they weren't as much as I thought. I mean, most of the tricks do read well enough to learn, and they are varied and strong. And it worried me when, you know, I heard the description of Edward Brown as being a magician's magician, because I envisaged these long, drawn-out, complicated plots that nobody can follow. But actually, that was uh, pretty far from the truth. Most of the tricks I wanted to learn with the cards in my hand, even the less versatile ones I found I became fascinated with because of the way they worked. And he was clearly someone that was interested and passionate about both effect and plot. Uh, he, he was someone that seemed to not only want to fool magicians, but perform for them. So even though he did do most of his performance um, in lectures at the Magic Circle, it was still about entertaining. He still talks about how to entertain with simplicity of plot and things like that. So, so there's more, again, in this than I was envisaging. I'll just run through what I highlights for me. I won't run through all 19 effects. Uh, but again, lots of surprises here for me. The spelling trick at the beginning. The minute I sort of read the word spelling in a trick, I kind of think, oh, God. You know, and some spelling's all right, but a whole trick that's a spelling trick. But actually, this was one of his well-known tricks. And... And I can see why. If you look at David Williamson's He Who Spelt It, Delhi, I think that's what it's called. You know, the comedy in that of someone getting something wrong and spelling it out and getting the right card is based on this. And, and you can see, again, that there is comedy in this where you wouldn't have originally found it. He's got his version of Hofzinser's, easy for me to say, Hofzinser's Everywhere and Noma, no, Nowhere, which is... Uh, a plot that we all know, but there's a diminishing count. So we've got the early version of the diminishing count that so many of us do now, but with a really nice but quite difficult way of making it very, very convincing, uh, a little bit palmy, which I've become absolutely obsessed with. He's got a poker hand, which surprised me because I thought it was going to be tedious, but plays big. And a lot of his tricks, because he used to perform on stage at the Magic Circle, he worked out how to play out. And that is so important, you know, if we're doing a card trick that we're not down here. So he uses glasses a lot to kind of make the visuals push outwards towards the stage, which I loved. Uh, his 12 card thought transposition, which Andy Gladwin demonstrated at the session, is just stunning. And, of course, this diminishing card sequence. Um, I, not the diminishing count that's in Everywhere and Nowhere, but there's diminishing card routine which I've seen different versions of, and a lot of versions require the hand kind of going somewhere and doing something that always looks a bit iffy. Uh, this, I think, is going to be my new uh, obsession. And one of my favourite parts of this is reading the lectures from, like I said, from 1934 and 1935 up till 1947. And I've always wondered what it is about books. You know, some of us just get really into books. It's not even reading them all the time. It's reading bits of them or having them. And I think part of it is that the knowledge of what they contain. But a lot of it is what Stephen King, he, he wrote in his book on writing, is when he, his theory on writing, that uh, he, he is described writing as telepathy. It's mind reading, right? Someone puts their thoughts on a paper and then years later you can read it. And that gets a little bit closer to what I think the fascination is. But when I'm reading, you know, these lectures, it's almost, it's also time travel, right? So we are... We read, I'm reading a lecture from, 19, from the 1940s and I'm imagining, because there's no video of, of Edward G. Brown, and this is the closest we're going to get, and I'm imagining him standing in the magic circle saying these exact words that were trans transcribed uh, and realising that, you know, it's 2019 now and they are still relevant and realising that what they, what they prove is that magic is that's why we love it. it hasn't really changed you know we still we think it's developed and we think you know a bit of technology and all that but it hasn't really changed because he's still talking about stuff that we talk about at conventions or we talk about in the bar at the moment you know he's talking about the fact that you know we can't overdo most direction because it comes too obvious he's talking about the difference between conjuring for magicians or he calls it conjuring for conjurers uh, and for lay people and the fact that we shouldn't dismiss one or the other he talks he's got a big uh, lecture about mentalism and again, the, th the things that can kind of ruin that and how a lot of mentalism has a lot of process. So we have to we have to put a little bit more showmanship into it. Uh, and he talks about how we, st we you know, even back then, you're trying to buy the new trick or buy the new book or buy the new lecture notes rather than actually studying theory. And he has a big thing about, you know, we don't study enough theory in magic. So all of these things are things that I bang on about in the bar uh, to magicians at conventions. So so it's it's totally relevant and I, I almost suggest going to the end before doing anything and reading these lectures because they're they're absolutely magical in a very different way i really felt a kind of just a, just a real joy of being of, of being able to read those lectures and still feeling like i could sort of nod my head or, or in agreement or shake it in disagreement um as if someone was you know 
as if I was reading a genie from last month. And of course, the big bonus is Andy Gladwin's study guide, because without that, well, without that, the crediting would be a little bit all over the place and a bit shallow because, as Andy said, Ed, um, Trevor Hall had quite a small circle of influence and there was no internet, all right? So, the, so we, we, have, we have more accuracy now. We've got an idea of where these tricks come from and who did originate in them. And it doesn't shine a light completely on this because we still don't know all the answers, but it, it just makes that a bit more accurate, which is nice to know. There are also some additions to tricks um, and a little bit of explanation about some of the slides, but there are still some frustrations one of which are things like this and this is my little niggle in magic books because you've got if, if you've only got a book to go by right especially without that many pictures the odd one but the odd one showing actually the simplest bit of the whole thing but this is from the cards up the sleeve so uh, and by gripping the side edges between the first finger and thumb but what what side did you, you know what I mean? We're, we're now starting to get into, I want, I'm starting to want pictures or more detail. And by the pressure of the third finger, the front six cards are moved so that they overlap the remainder by about half an inch, but overlap where? And the cards again taken by the right hand as a performer explains that he's about to attempt to pass the cards from left hand. And, and so, and, and I'm reading that, and I've read a lot of magic books, and I'm going, right, overlap, but where? And the cut. And I'm kind of getting it because I've read the cards up to see before and I'm coming out of my own way, but there's, there's a, a, quite a lot of that going on where you have to read it again and again to go, yeah, but where are you gripping? And the cards up the sleeve is a classic. Loads of people do it. We can look at the Vernon one. We can, we can suss it out. So it is a major problem, but just be aware. That's probably, that is the only bit really that I looked at and was like, Ugh. and then there's quite a lot of where there's an assumption that you know certain things that if you're like me and you've, you know, I've got big gaps. Uh, of those classics that, that I, I need to go and research elsewhere. So I'm not, it's no way saying I don't don't get it. I'm totally glad I've got it. But be aware that there, there are some frustrations, like I said, that may even add to the charm of the book. So as with everything, uh, it's not for everybody either. This is for card enthusiasts. This is quite challenging stuff, a lot of it, even though it's got a couple of self-workers, mathematical principles in it. Uh, and it's not a, a, a a book you're going to read to find your next closer at your tables okay it might inspire you to think of something especially when you look at the, the thought transposition but it's not it's it's for those people who want to sit down learn you know widen their knowledge and become even more of an expert at what they do which will be card magic in this in this case so not for everybody but just for me a very very important publication so I got a lot out of this book, and not just because of the magic tricks, because I now know this man, I know his story, and he's become part of my magic vocabulary. And for someone that died in 1947, I think that's quite important. I also think it's important that in 2019 and onwards, we're reconnected with the people who developed and grew these routines that we, that we love and do when we're out working and performing or in our magic clubs. So I think it's a really, really rich experience reading this book. Uh, so you can get it from vanishinink.com or vanishinink.co.uk. I think it's around 50 pounds, $60, and it's released today. Um, not if you're watching this in two weeks time, but today's around about the 4th of February. So uh, have a good one. Any questions, do comment, check out carmagiccourse.com and please like and subscribe. Thank you.